ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the, uh, for the chat. <laughs> I'm very pleased to have here tonight Martin Gion Giosi. Yes. Very difficult name to pronounce. <laughs> Uh, Martin is a member of the Hungarian Parliament for the Jobbik Party, and he is both their party spokesman <coughs> on foreign affairs as well as being uh, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So I've got that right. Now, his party has always described itself as a principled conservative and radically patriotic Christian party whose Bravo. fundamental purpose is the protection of Hungarian national values and interests. Needless to say, the inevitable attacks have been made against it by the usual suspects. Uh, we have them here, of course, very active. And, um, but the philosopher Agnes Heller said that Jobbik has never been an extreme right party. I suppose the media here would probably just call them hard right. I mean, they call everyone hard right uh, that isn't left. Um, but anyway, since 2014, Jobbik has attempted to redefine itself, drop some policies which enabled it to be smeared and roundly attacked. Its national board unanimously decided in favor of a traditional right-wing conservative policy approach. In the 2014 and 2018 national elections, their vote remained steady at around 20%. Is that right? That's right. And they have 26 seats in the parliament, making it the second largest party. You will all know that, to some extent, the, that Mr. Orban and his party have taken some of the wind out of Jobbik's sails by adopting uh, Jobbik's uh, policies, particularly on, on immigration. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have affected them. They've still got their, their 26 seats, so that's jolly good. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm going to ask Martin to address you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor and pleasure to be here tonight. And uh, never mind if you can't pronounce my name pro uh, correctly. I know some Englishmen who are trying for the last 30 years and they <laughs> still can't succeed. It is one of the more difficult Hungarian names. Uh, but uh, it is my great pleasure to be here today uh, upon the invitation of the traditional Britain group. Uh, <clears throat> it is. Uh, an excellent opportunity to discuss here this evening some relevant political and social uh, matters that concern all of us, uh, our whole European civilization and uh, our nations, the British or the Hungarian nation, which are two far away nations but uh, still parts of the same civilization. We live in a very interesting and very uh, turbulent era in an era which uh, is probably, which can be described as a post-ideological era, whereby globalization and digitalization has brought about challenges that we have never seen before. And if we look at the political and social phenomena that surround us in almost every European country, it is very, very difficult to define or characterize these phenomena on the basis of uh, 20th century political terminology. Left, right, conservative, liberal, labor, leftist, rightist thinking, they apply less and less to the era that we live in. And some of the, the depth of the changes that we are experiencing today and the consequences that these changes have, I think some of the social, social theorists and political scientists, they have a great problem grasping some of these and they don't even see the, the unforeseen consequences of some of the changes that we are experiencing today. 
I was very glad to, to meet uh, some of my um, alumni colleagues from Trinity College Dublin. That's where I studied in, uh, in the 90s as a university uh, student. And uh, I studied economics and political science. And one of the greatest questions at the time among students, or amongst teachers even, or in the literature, was what will the post-Cold War era look like? What will be the new world order be? What will our, our civilization and what will the, the, the new world order uh, be like? And two very popular uh, writings at the time, which were basically contradicting each other, were Francis Fukuyama's End of History and uh, Huntington's response to this on Clash of Civilizations. And even at the time, I mean, some of the brighter students already, they were already laughing and mocking at the uh, highly naive theory of the end of history, especially some, some of those students who come, came from a, from a world which was very, uh, how should I say, ideology driven. We could, I, I still can't imagine a world without um, theoretical divide or ideological divide. But at the time, in the 90s, it, it definitely sound, sounded like a very uh, naive uh, type of uh, political uh, thinking. But nonetheless, Francis Fukuyama has made the point that after the fall of communism, uh, in political, social, and economic uh, field, liberalism will prevail. And since communism, the only challenger to liberal theory has fallen, now all nations and all countries will embrace happily this lovely liberal theory uh, that prevailed in the, in the West in opposition to communist ideology. And hence, he spoke about the end of history. Now, Huntington was talking about the rise of, of, other, of, of civilizations and the clash of civilizations. Um, and if we look at what is happening in the world today, I think we can experience some sort of clash of civilizations. The Western civilization, which is of course still a dominant civilization, and all those civilizations which are on the rise amongst, well, one of them being the Islamic civilization. And when it comes to the migration crisis and immigration as an enormous challenge that we are all facing, uh, then this problem or the clash of civilization is, to, is just all too obviously uh, there as a reality. And uh, if we look at this challenge and this issue, this problem of uh, mass migration and uncontrolled migration in our world today, then we also, besides trying to f try to find some tool to combat this enormous challenge, I think we should find the sources and the root of this problem, because this is only a consequence of uh, a problem which I think is twofold. Firstly, if we say or if we agree that migration is only a result and a consequence of something, uh, then we also have to uh, search for the root of the problem and say that the root is misguided, uh, bad, uh, catastrophic foreign policy of Western countries. Of course, the United States is one of the, or the only geopolitical player, real geopolitical player in the Western world today. But some EU member states and some Western countries uh, have happily assisted to uh, these geopolitical ambitions of the United States, which has basically destabilized our entire neighborhood from North Africa through to the Middle East uh, and to some degree even the Ukraine, one of uh, my country's uh, neighbors. The other one being neoliberal economic policy, which has basically entirely economically de destabilized our neighborhood uh, I won't go into details, but African 
development aid or aid uh, policy as such, which Western uh, countries have forced in the past decades has also led to an entire disaster and has basically led to the consequences that um, uh, we see today. When we look at the whole migration issue, which arose just a couple of years ago, we can see that the real problem in our continent today is not necessarily the external problem of migration, but the answers that are given to this enormous challenge within our continent. There are basically just, it's an oversimplification, but there are generally two answers uh, given to this challenge. One of them is the Western liberal approach, which basically says uh, that after a long experience with multiculturalism, let's open up the borders. There's an enormous economic need for external cheap labor force. There is a big industrial lobby. So, uh, and we are multicultural societies, say the Western liberal societies. Let's open up the borders and uh, let's invite basically anyone who is ready to come this direction. There is another thinking which is, well, mainly characteristic of uh, some Central Eastern European countries, and in particular, I think, my country, a small country, but in this particular issue, it has been in the, in the forefront, or it has been basically taking the lead in organizing Central Eastern European countries, uh, generally conservative countries, generally monocultural countries in, in, as opposed to multicultural countries. We are still rather homogeneous societies. And we have basically uh, said, uh, Central Eastern European countries, that mass migration, uncontrolled migration, must be stopped and it cannot be, um, uh, it, it cannot be left uncontrolled at the borders of Europe. Uh, we should not bring the troubles of the world to Europe, but if necessary, we have to bring the help from Europe to uh, where the source of this problem uh, lies. Now, when it comes to this debate between Central Eastern European uh, or more conservative uh, societies and the liberal world, then of course we are uh, always told or lectured about the merits of multiculturalism, uh, which we are, of course, ready to hear, but when we look this direction at uh, some of the liberal societies that nurture multiculturalism, it just doesn't took, look too attractive uh, if we look at the social, the economic, or the political uh, consequences. And, of course, we also know, I mean, we have to be fair, uh, we know the reasons for that argument, or the liberal argument, or the Western argument, and we know why we take the position that we take. I mean, it has historical underpinnings, and it has a historical background. Of course, we know that some of the Western European countries, they have had uh, long centuries of uh, liberal experiment. Uh, they have had colonies, which has basically opened the, the borders uh, for uh, basically cultural uh, mixing and multiculturalism. It has basically, it's, it's something which has started a long, long time ago in Western Europe, in the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Great Britain, uh, Spain. I mean, these are all countries which for centuries have had very close relationship with the outer world. And uh, there were long, long centuries of peaceful uh, cooperation with uh, economic, cultural cooperation with uh, much of the world. And it has basically started to develop a society which is multicultural or which is open to multiculturalism. This is very different from the experience that my country had. We are a very proud nation, an old nation and a proud nation, one of the very uh, oldest uh, nation states on the continent, 1,100 years of age and as a nation state, as the Kingdom of Hungary or uh, Hungary as it is today. Uh, but for most of our history, we have had a very inward looking history where we were fighting off external uh, attempts to invade our country and we have had a constant battle for 
sovereignty and for preserving our identity, our sovereignty, our independence. And this has made, basically made us very, very cautious. It's somehow in our genes. I think it's genetically coded. If you are Hungarian and something is said uh, in any great city of the world, whether it's called Moscow, Brussels, or Washington, doesn't really matter, everybody is suspicious. <laughs> and I think it's for a good reason. It's, it's, it's what you call historical experience or historic experience. Uh, this is just for you to understand where we are coming from. Uh, and I think this is no different for Polish, Czech, or other nations which are there uh, in the region. And I think this is the basis for this misunderstanding between the Western and the Eastern part of our continent on this uh, single topic. Now, migration has brought this, these differences uh, to the surface and has made very clear that we think quite differently about uh, our values and about uh, Europeanness as such. And I think after having seen, and this is only, I mean, this is a common thinking that we will have to do because it's still in the making or it's still developing. Uh, we don't have any concrete results because it's only something which has surfaced in the past two or three years. Uh, but the debate is there. And what I can see is that our Western civilization is in deep trouble, uh, Europe in particular. We have entered some kind of a, of, a, of a vicious circle or a trap from which we basically cannot get out of Europe or the European continent or the European Union. I don't know if, uh, if these are synonyms, but uh, it is quite visible that we cannot find uh, answers to the many questions that are posed. And we don't see the solutions to uh, many of the challenges that we are facing uh, these days. And the trap is that it appears for most countries, especially in Western Europe, that there is no way back to the nation state because these, some of our Western European partners have basically entered uh, or tread on the path of uh, multiculturalism. And from this uh, basically ever-growing uh, multicultural social context, you cannot basically return back to the, to the, to the, to the nation, to the monocultural nationhood or to the indigenous uh, nation state as such. And there is also no way forward towards federalism, which a lot of our European partners are talking about because the fundamentals and the base for federalism in Europe is basically not set. The framework is not there. And I believe that the new divide on the continent is not right and left. I think these are terms which are there, and they are very, very important uh, definitions and very important contexts. But the main battleground, I think, is between federalists and anti-federalists on the continent. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if, we, if we look at the European Union as a structure, they have basically coded uh, a trap into the whole system. Jean Monnet was talking about the ever closer union. And basically, the history of the European Union is a is a basically continuous progression towards unity. But in order to have that, you have to have a common European identity. And a common European identity, I think, as a, as a concept, is basically a utopia and an illusion on a continent which is just too colorful and just too uh, diverse. And since there is this uh, diversity and there is no basis and fundamentals for federalism, there is no way back to the homogeneous nation state, there is an entire deadlock on the European continent and we can see this uh, quite vividly on the surface in European uh, debate today. When the European Union was established, 
There was the European Council, which basically consists of the leaders of the member states, prime ministers or presidents, and they represent the interests of the nation states. At the same time, you have the Commission, which, or the European Parliament, or the courts, which are basically representing the federalist structure. And there is a, a balance between the two. There is no, there is basically no uh, uh, weight given to one or the other. So there is a, a, a perfect deadlock amongst the institutions of the EU. And there is no common European identity and no political community can prevail without common European identity. And I think this is uh, what um, we have to solve as an enormous challenge. How do we get over this? Some people are forcing the federalist structure, most of our European friends. Some other people are forcing the cooperation of nation states, some kind of fed confederation of nation states along the, the Golian uh, lines. And I think this is the closest we can get to some kind of uh, fruitful European cooperation of diverse nations, but some kind of European uh, cooperation. What is the future of Europe in a, in a multipolar world order which is developing these days. I mean, it is clearly the end of, of the unipolar world order which Fukuyama has dreamt, dreamt of. It has never been there. After the bipolar world, world era, the unipolar world has never really come to existence. But where is the place of Europe and where is the future of Europe in a multipolar world order? In a world order where Russia, China, India, the Islamic civilization are on the rise. I mean, every single European country, even Germany, even Great Britain, is too small in this global context. So I think there is only, uh, if Europe wants to stand and if it wants to have a future, it has to find some way of cooperating and standing up against the challenges that we are facing uh, today. Europe's greatest achievement is that it could reconciliate contradicting values throughout the centuries. Some of these contradicting values entail Christianity, the Greek-Roman humanism, and the rationalism of the Renaissance. I mean, these are incredibly contradicting developments if you think about it. And European culture and European civilization is about unifying these uh, values into one uh, European identity and into one European culture and European civilization. And if we think about what really civilization means and what is at the core of every civilization, then I think Arnold Toynbee was right, the great British historian who said that the foundations of every civilization is based on religion. The religious fundamentals are the basis for every single civilization. And I think it is a very important observation if we are trying to find the key to Europe's future or about common European identity. Europe's history, I think, for most of the time, was equal to uh, the history of Christianity, up until recently, or up until the French Revolution, I would, I would dare to say, but even a bit afterwards. But I think in the past decades, uh, this statement doesn't quite hold. But for most of Europe's history, the history of Europe was identical to the history of Christianity. And the Respublica Christiana has always been the framework which was accepted by everyone in the European context. By everyone, even atheists. Even they said that I don't believe in God, but this civilization that I happen to live in or that I was born into is based and founded on Christian values and the Christian uh, civilizational context. 
Everybody accepted it, everybody adopted it, bar the liberals. They have never adopted it. And this is the reason why liberals, when it comes to uncontrolled migration, they have, they have basically no argument. They don't want to pick up on this topic. They say, well, just, just let, it, let it happen. It, it's, it's not a problem. I mean, it's, it's something which is, it's a natural progress. We are all the same. We should help them. Let migration flow through our civilization and basically dilute our civilizational values and our cultural values. So liberals just don't wish to discuss mass immigration of, uh, of Muslims through our continent, for instance. And this is, I believe, one of the most important issues that we are facing in the decades or in the centuries uh, to come. And there are a number of unresolved questions with regard to how we are going to, going to deal with this issue, migration and uncontrolled immigration. How can we, as Europeans, uh, restrain or restrict the fundamental European principles in the context of, in the context of uh, say, freedoms or tolerance against migration? Because these are values which most Europeans uh, think of as European values. Or Christian ethics, which basically calls for uh, love of your uh, brothers and basically love of uh, whole humanity and provide a helping hand in need. How do we reconcile Christian ethics with closing the borders? These are all questions that we have to basically answer and these are all questions which are there in the debates even if they are not put in this context or they are not asked in this particular context. There is no clear solution uh, but one thing is sure that the liberal answer is a disaster. And the liberal answer is one thing that we cannot yield to. One thing is for sure that we have to close down the borders. We cannot let uncontrolled mass migration sweep through our civilization. But this will not do, well, it will basically protect us from the immediate damage or from the immediate harm, but I think it is not the biggest problem that we are facing. Because the biggest problem Europe is facing is not external, but internal. We can close down every border, we can send home every illegal immigrant from our country, but the question still arises whether Europe or our civilization can survive. Because our civilization does not have solid uh, value-based fundamentals. It has been basically washed out in the past centuries. And it's a long, long trip. I think since the Enlightenment has come in, humanism, the Renaissance, which has put humanity in the center and removed God from the context, we are basically in complete decline over the centuries. It's a long, long trip. Of course, it doesn't hit suddenly, but it is a slide. It's on the downward slope. And I think that all the liberalism that followed humanism or the Renaissance, the French Revolution, I think that was a big cornerstone or a big milestone in this journey. And what has happened since the rise of the new left, communism, and not even communism was the biggest problem, but in Western Europe, the infiltration of conservative thinking by the liberal values and by the thinking of the new left, which has basically washed away the fundamentals of our civilization. And uh, I think if we look at the responses that we are giving in the Western hemisphere, to some of these challenges are quite frightening because they are completely missing the point. Just recently we had some visit to Hungary by some of the celebrated leaders of the alt-right movement. And I'm also listening to some of 
our Western European friends who are, of course, trying to combat uh, migration in their country, in the Netherlands, uh, even in this country, uh, in Belgium, in France. And I think they are, they are somewhat missing the point. Because I think, of course, when the house is burning, then you have to fight the fire, and you have to extinguish the fire. That's the most immediate uh, task that all of us have to be active in. But that in itself does not solve the problem. In itself, it does not stand the so-called air test that Julius Evola has spoken about when he was uh, drafting the, the, the new concept for conservative thinking. And he said that any theory which is formulated against something, it doesn't, it doesn't mean much. It has to stand alone and stand in itself. In vacuum, it has to stand the test. This is the air test. If it can basically stand on its own, alone, and not only up against something, what conservative thinking in most of the continent means today is basically opposing something. It is nothing more than anti-liberalism or counter-leftism, if you like. But if you would ask some continentals who call themselves conservative, if they could write down on a piece of white paper the values that they believe in, they would put down things which differ in no way from what a liberal would put down on the paper. And this is the real disaster. Oh. Ah. This is the real disaster. If we would close down the border and from tomorrow onwards we would not have one single foreigner or non-European come into our continent or Muslim come into our continent, I'm afraid we would still not be able to define who we are. And this is the real tragedy of our civilization. And if we have to start somewhere in rebuilding our civilization or finding the fundamentals to our uh, culture or our common European identity, then we have to start there with the religious values, with the traditional values, which we share. We are a very colorful and a very um, complex civilization, there is enormous diversity on the continent. This is the reason why I don't believe in European federalism, because there is still a lot, there's a lot that unites us, but still a lot that divides us. Uh, but there is this value base, which was there, which used to be there, but which we denied over the past centuries, that we have to get back to. Because these are the solid fundamentals of our civilization in Great Britain, in Hungary, in Germany, in Spain. We have to basically start from the beginning and rebuild our civilizational foundations. Because of course it is right to say that we don't want to live in an Islamic society or we don't want Muslims to uh, invade our nations. But are we going to be more Christians if they, are, if they stay away? No. My real problem is that we are not, uh, we, we, we don't have any connection to our Christian values anymore. In Austria, which is supposed to be one of the more conservative countries of this continent, or of that continent, sorry, of the continent, um, <laughs> one of the neighbors of Hungary, and we would agree on migration policy in, in, on, on most points with the Austrian leadership, especially the new one. But a couple of years ago, there was a European song contest where a bearded woman oh. named Conchita Wurst under the Austrian flag won the competition, which is, well, okay. I mean, what do you expect from, from Europe in the, in the 21st century? But what happened afterwards was utterly shocking. Heinz Fischer, who used to be the president of Austria at the time, and Christoph Schönborn, who is the head of the church, the Catholic church in Austria, and he was 
almost, he was almost nominated, uh, well, he was nominated as candidate for, for Pope uh, in the previous contest. Uh, he is one of the strong leaders of European or Catholicism on the continent. They have basically issued uh, press releases congratulating and celebrating this monster and saying that, well, this is, this is the celebration of the European values. I mean, okay, I, I accept, uh, I don't accept it from anyone, uh, even from a president, but uh, I mean, from a lay uh, individual or from a, from, from a president or from a minister, okay, we got used to that. But from the head of a church, especially the Catholic church, yeah. which is probably the most traditionalist organization uh, that has ever existed, and from Christoph Schönborn, who is, uh, who, is a, uh, who is an important figure in the Catholic Church, something like that is treason. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's going against everything which is European culture or European civilization. Mm. And when I see that, I'm a bit worried about the future, and uh, I have more questions uh, than I have answers to, to some of the challenges that we are facing. And as I was given half an hour for my speech, um, <laughs> but I have come to the end of what I had to say, uh, I, I would love to have some uh, uh, questions that I can answer. And uh, hopefully we can proceed in a more interactive fashion because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you do have things to ask, uh, questions to put forward. And I would love to continue this evening uh, I don't know if I can moderate the discussion or... or uh, I'll moderate. Will you do? Please. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.